What I used to do at the late night show was make sure, the way Stalin did, that there were images of me everywhere. Yes. Just, yes. you know, magazine covers and everything was Conan, and then you get to Sonus Party Office and it was all, it's always sunny. Yeah. Uh, just pretty much that whole area. It was a lot of pain. There's fun. Your gang, that you had this, I don't know, similar philosophy about making people laugh that made me very happy, which was just this, things could get very anarchic and crazy, but the show never really took itself very seriously and still mm -hmm. hasn't. And, um, and there was just a pure, raw, we're going to have fun mm -hmm. and, um, and make fools of ourselves if need be. I think we're in the business, uh, the very serious business of how ridiculous can we be? Yeah. Which isn't as easy as just saying, okay, let's go goof off. Like, we'll put an extraordinary amount of work and thought and conversation into the most ridiculous thing. Yes. Yeah. It's a funny dichotomy that I talk to people about, which is I am two things, very silly, and I love abstract foolishness taken to its extreme, and I'm also deadly, deadly serious about it. <laughs> and you understand that the two things coexist, because I think there are a lot of people who think, oh, the Always Sunny guys, if you, you know, if you hung out in their writer's room, if you hung out with them, it's just clowning all the time. And I know for a fact that no, there are probably very, very heated arguments <laughs> yeah. about how the really stupid things should happen. We got, we got in one this year, 16 years into doing the show, and a good sort of heated debate about this is the way to do it, and this is the way to do it. We do it every single, it's exhausting, <laughs> it's exhausting, but it's all that sort of arguing and planning so that you can have that you know, 15 minutes of just raw funny, which is like, oh, we all agree that this is the best scenario for something to be funny and now just let it rip. Because right. we feel sort of safe, like we've built up the work around it and here's a playground with which to destroy the guess. But the problem of meaning and value is not going to be solved in future by the social order. We're not going to have God given us as our birthright. Rather, Christianity is forced back to its original starting point in the individual heart and conscience. Marx, of course, agrees that man has come of age, that the world is now purely human and secular, and that we face a consequent crisis in values. But for Marx, value is a function of our objective social relations. Change those politically, and the problem of restoring value to human life is solved. The divergence between Kierkegaard and Marx during the 1840s remains fundamental to us to this day. Some of us are instinctively political. To others, it's equally obvious that the problem of finding a philosophy of life and a faith to live by today is in the end a religious problem that can only be solved within the individual human spirit. But those who think Kierkegaard is right had better count the cost. In order to save the traditional sense of life's ultimate religious importance, he squeezed the whole of traditional doctrine with all its supernatural, indeed cosmic, conflicts within the narrow compass of the human soul. This certainly had the effect of heightening subjectivity, but at a price. The Kierkegaardian self remains a theatre of conflict all its life. A human being must live in such a state of anguish that if he were a pagan, he would not hesitate to commit suicide. In this state, then, he must live. <laughs>